On the podcast today, we're going to dissect the fourth chapter of the Tao Te Ching, which is part of our 81 Meditations of the Tao Te Ching series for those who are new to the channel. We've already done the first three chapters, so you can find that in the playlist. And we will dissect, yeah, as I said, chapter four. And in this chapter, Lao Tzu actually returns back to the mystery of Tao. You know, a few chapters he's gone through the sort of our attitude and how we should behave and kind of the social aspects, which he does go back and forth throughout the Tao Te Ching, obviously. And, you know, about desires and all of that. Yeah. And that's also covered within this chapter a little bit too, but it's mainly a return to the mystery of the Tao. So let me read this for everyone. The Tao is an empty vessel. It is used but never filled. O oh, unfathomable source of 10,000 things, blunt the sharpness, untangle the knot, soften the glare, merge with dust. O oh, hidden deep but ever present, I do not know from whence it comes. It is the forefather of the ancestors. That last line can actually be translated also as it is the forefather of the gods. So, either way, uh, the, the idea is there, yeah? So, actually the first, the, the first line, the Tao is an empty vessel, and also the, la, uh, the last line are kind of related, which we'll get into later. It is the forefather of the ancestors. So... Anyway, let's have a look at that. So, the f so you can see there in this chapter that you have kind of a an explanation of the Tao, but you also have kind of a a temperament that we should have, where it says like blunt the sharpness, untangle and not soften the glare. You know, even though that may seem uh, vague and abstract for other people who are unfamiliar with Taoism, but for you and I, well, we understand that. And for those who understand Chinese, we understand that. But so, nevertheless, let's start with the beginning. The Tao is an empty vessel. It is used, but never filled, right? So, that's kind of alluding to sort of this, uh, this, this nothingness, right? Like this, the Tao is kind of this <clears throat> ultimate reality, that is incomprehensible to, to logical understanding. Yeah, this chapter again is uh, going back to right, going back to to the starting point. Yep. Right. So although it uh, may seem pretty, it is pretty actually um, self-explanatory. But I think it could be also maybe one of the most important chapter too. Personally, it's one of my favorite chapters right. in the whole Tao Te Ching. Because that is to understand what the source is, mm. the original source of the 10,000 things, mm. right? Mm. Um, without having um, a thorough understanding of what Tao is in itself, everything else is actually meaningless, to be honest. Mm. Or you wouldn't be able to understand properly, mm. I don't think. Mm. Yeah, so the Tao is an empty vessel. It is used but never filled. Mm. So the beginning, whenever and wherever and whatever that is, mm -hmm. is the beginning of all this entire universe and the human species being like right at the end of the creation. Um, and if, again, like it both meet at the end at of the, the end. Yeah. Mm. That's what's so fascinating thing. Well, it's kind of like it's, it transcends all life, but it's imminent within all life. Yes. That's a, a basic way I can explain the Tao mm. for people like, because like you, some people think that it's something like, uh, for example, like Confucius, right? If there was something, the Tao is something that you had to try and induce. But as it says here, it's, it's ever present, yeah. it says in this chapter, right? Like it's not something that's not there. That's with you, but the Tao is not like uh, s some some sort of god, uh, you know, lording it over you. That's why they say in the Tao that Qing, the Tao loves and nourishes all, but does not lord it over anyone, yeah. over them, you know. So, and that's kind of what the temperament of this, or the attitude of this chapter, right? Yeah, and right at the last two lines, I do not know when, from whence it comes. It is the forefather of the ancestors. Mm. 
So basic. I do not know when it began. Mm. When when um, who gave the birth to it? Mm. When gave the birth mm-hmm. to it? So and that if, if birth is even a thing to it, it's exactly right. So that it surpassed the, our concept of time too, mm. right? Mm. Like it, there is no. Uh, uh, limitation it's not finite mm. it's 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 infinite mm. and it it is the forefather of the ancestors so that's how old it is <laughs> so that it's some sense so that, ancient yeah it's some sense that like like you just mentioned that confucius thought that it's something that you cultivate and mm. nourish and work for it and for entire your life uh, that sounds pretty nonsensical yeah well, this is where Zhuangzi came in and would scoff at Confucius's, you know, ideas of Tao, right? Zhuangzi came in and said, it, it's, it's so incomprehensible. Because it's incomprehensible, it, it transcends logical r- reasoning. And so you can't come up with a logical conclusion mm. as to what Tao is because it's beyond the scope of, in, of uh, intellectual inquiry. And I think... Only way that you can understand what the Tao is to practice, mm. practice it. Not in not trying to um, understand logically or intellectually, like mm. how Confucius was trying to. Yeah, of to. course. Yeah. Yeah. And that's how most people try to understand certain spiritual paths these days, right? Like they try and understand certain, uh, like if you, even if you use God in other traditions, God in some sense even though they've given it form you know, th- through intellectual analysis and maybe have said that God is some sort of being, still that would transcend their own, well, it should transcend their own knowledge. Mm. <clears throat> you know. But the idea of Tao, because Tao is not some sort of being, it's kind of this ultimate reality, same as in Brahman, in Vedanta, is that it's, uh, as it says, it's, it's an empty vessel. It's used but never filled. You know, so it's kind of ever present, it's there. And the way that we experience it is when we become an empty vessel. Mm. We begin to act as a kind of aperture for the universe to express itself. Mm. But when we are full, you know, they're used, allowed to use the, the, the cup analogy, right? The mind cup. Well, I say the mind cup, right? I said mind cup and fasting the mind. Uh, because when you, you know, you know, like Lao Tzu's thing, like what do you value, the, the cup or the space within the cup? And obviously the space within the cup is what Taoists would value, you know, because the, if you don't have the space within the cup, you, there's no use, There's no use, mm. you know. And I know a lot of people probably get in the comments now and who are way too analytical and go, yeah, but the cup has, but you're missing the point of, you're missing the whole philosophical point that Lao is trying to make is that that empty space is what's valuable, but we don't value it, right? Intellectually, we don't value the space. We value the cup, mm. and and so, and in, and in another sense, when your cup is too full, it's overflowing. Like I, I use yeah. the mind cup analogy in, yeah. in yeah. passing the mind, then that's when your whole system is out of balance, and your mind is full. Mm. So your cup is full. So the space is what's valuable. So leaving an empty cup. And in this sense, leaving your mind, your, your faculties within your mind empty to allow things to come, to come through. Yeah, exactly. That, it's, that space is what allows you to feel anything. It yes. could be water, it could be just a, some, some juice or anything. Mm, anything. So in, in, in the same thing within our mind is the mm. same. Mm. Is that space is what's important, and the space in this uh, chapter is to be that source of ten thousand things, which is there. Mm. And the second line is saying, "Oh, unfathomable, un- unfathomable source of ten thousand things." So it's incomprehensible. Mm. Like yeah. that's what it's uh, unfathomable. That's what Lotus understanding too. He he understood it's unfathomable. So. Mm. Mm leave it at that not try to analyze it or intellectualize it because it's beyond that mm. it transcends intellectual analysis and the thing is is that that's and it's funny because like when you understand it as a mystery it has much more meaning to you right you know what i mean because there's something that's beyond your mind and it actually it can't it actually has a has a uh, positive effect on your life because it, it kind of releases tension 
in you because you don't know the game. You think you know the game, what's going on here, right? Mm. But the Tao is the game. Mm. And, that, and, the, and that you don't know. You know it, it's there because it's imminent within all life and you sense it in your life. You sense, you know, when you are a certain way, your life has a certain rhythm about it and, you know, you, you have, when you're at ease, certain things happen, you know, so forth and so on, right? But you cannot know the, the playing field of the Tao. That again, that mystery keeps people always engaging and curious, mm. right? That wandering mind. Yeah. And in the process of doing it, you begin to slowly understand what the mystery was about, mm. right? Yeah. That's why, that's the, I think the secret of this uh, kind of ancient knowledge. Yeah. That somewhat mystery has to remain as mystery, I think. Mm. Yeah. Once we try to interpret it in a certain way, then you start to get warped, I think. Yeah, of course. And that's what happened, just like what ha- what's happening with the, like, this uh, new age spirituality, right? Mm. And without people trying to fully, thoroughly understand what, the, let's say, Hindu philosophy, mm. but they try to give it a name, try to <clears throat> give it a, like, intellectual understanding from their own um, idea in, the, in their version of reality so that <clears throat> it becomes an interesting and strange shape of and it becomes just its own path of spirituality right yeah. in the end it became got nothing to do with the original tradition that mm. they were studying no it's a whole new flaky yeah. system yeah so, like, even in the Upanishads, when it says, when you know the Brahman, you do not know the Brahman. But when you do not know the Brahman, you know the Brahman. So there's something in this, in this unknowing, unknowingness when you come into contact with this. And that's why the mystery is essentially mystical, right? Mm. The mystical traditions, is, they're mystical because you are trying to reside in the mystery of life, you know, and Tao, Brahman, these, especially these two words, essentially kind of mean mystery, like the, the mystery of existence. And because it is a mystery, you have a lot of awe and, and, and reverence for the mystery because it's beyond our puny intellect. You know, we can never understand it. You can be a scientist and playing with your little, you know, quantum physics measurements and this and that, but you'll never understand it fully. And that's what, that's what makes the mystics the mystics because they have a reverence towards that that essentially that mystery that they can never understand mm. that we can never understand but we can come into contact with it and align our life and we can attune to it mm. so to speak and we we get that sort of that experiential knowledge what you would call gnosis or jnana you, you get that experiential knowledge and that's the best that we can do as a human mm. you know and um, but that's that's like last week's podcast. We were talking about that. That's the that's the point of like kind of the, the human experience is to come back into alignment with that sort of that well the way the Tao, you know, and and to you know abide in that. And I think that way is how we all supposed to try to understand yep. in that way and the, only that way we can understand the mystery yeah. from our own self um, exploration yeah yeah exactly because the beginning was the Tao mm. which is the empty space and the the very outcome at last mm. is us yeah so we have to meet at some point <laughs> yeah from the very beginning to the very end, right? Mm-hmm. And that only can be experiential. Exactly, exactly. And come about and ex- as an experiential knowledge. Yeah, exactly. Well, the thing is, is that the... And even when you and I say n- emptiness or nothingness, it's not like it is sort of nothing. It is, it, but it's, it's like it is so empty that it has the potential to contain the entire universe. Right, so it can cont- it contains the in- it, there's a potential within the nothingness, yeah. and that's in some sense re- sense relates to us because we are like a, a miniature of the universe, 
but we are a, a reflection of the whole, right? So when we become empty as well, then there is a latent potential within us that th something can come from us. We're kind of like our own little mini Bing, Big Bang, yes. you know. So <clears throat> that can come from us. So it, it's a nothingness, but in the sense of, in the same sense of uh, uh, nothingness in, in Buddhism. But there's the kind of this this potential of this potentiality that resides within it that actually gave birth to the entire universe. Mm. You know, so that's there's no subject, there's no object, you know, there's no place or time in that pl in, in that nothingness, um, which actually gives us, you know, if you're in that state, it gives you a lot of peace and tranquility. But that's also the Tao, you know, to to analyze that, the Tao would, would have no, sub it has no subject, no object, no place or time, but it has the potential to give birth to, to all of life. Yeah, it's a um, mother of 10,000 things again. Exactly, exactly. And again, like, um, when was that? Like, a while ago when we went to Thailand for mm. the first time together. That's, um, yeah, 13 years ago, 14 mm. years ago. Mm. Um, anyway, at that time I had a book uh, in my hands that was um, about Korean philosophy. Mm. And, um, again, you never really thoroughly get to know uh, about the knowledge that came from your motherland basically <laughs> and again like because maybe it's too familiar mm. with anyone right yeah. so you'd kind of um, put that aside and then you get to interest you get to be interested in things that come from outside right because that looks more shiny something new right mm. but anyway i think i was at the time 23 24 or something like that and as i get to because um, that's the book I had in my hands and mm. there's, I mean, like, not much to do, so mm. I start reading. And, like, that chapter, uh, it, that book was uh, divided, the chapters, by the characters, that mm. the scholars. Mm. It just, so this um, a scholar that existed a long time ago, like, let's say, um, four or five hundred years ago, in Korea, uh, his name was Toege Yi Hwang, mm. and um, yeah, he was a Neo Confucian uh, scholar. So his idea is that in the sky, so in the universe, is empty, but it's not empty. Mm. It's full of energy mm. and force to give creation to anything. Yep. And that energy is made of yin and yang, mm. two principles that could give birth to any material mm. manifestation. So again, for me, that was so profound at that time yeah. because uh, you never actually think of that sort of con that kind of even concept at all. You're not learning that at high school. No, nah. <laughs> no, definitely not. Yeah. I, I don't know like, if teachers have that no, no, deeper no. contemplation about that kind of subject matter. But I think, again, that's what Carl Sagan was also oh, of course, talking yeah. about as mm, well. Mm, the, mm, mm. This vast, endless universe mm. is this full of um, energy and full of potential and possibility mm. that can give birth to anything mm. instead of considering as a whole waste of space. There's nothing. You know, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. It kind of flips the whole narrative around on its yeah. back, right? Like, because when you think about it materialistically, and you look out of space and you see nothing except for little, you know, little specks of light, you some people feel like anxious it? and afraid, and but yeah. then when you change the narrative to that, all of this empty space is is full of energy, full of potential. You know, there's dark matter now and science mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Not that everyone agrees with that sort of. Uh, science but mm -hmm. there is there is that sort of science you know and even if we look at like the the process of Tao from like the the birth of the ten thousand things to us so you have you have uji you have uji like the, this nothingness that contains all the potential and then you have the yin and yang energies that come out of the nothingness yeah. and then they solidify in the whole a representation of the whole as Tai Chi, Tai Chi being the yin and yang symbol, mm. and we are that symbol. Mm. We are the Tai Chi. Mm. 
see. So we are the representation of Tai Chi. Mm. You don't have to practice Tai Chi Chuan. You're already a representation of Tai Chi, right. but you're a manifestation of the Wu Chi. Mm. And going through the process of you know the yin and yang energies, molding the universe, right. and then we're a representation of that, mm. of that whole. Which is very well. Obviously, Neo Confucianism is a mix of Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism. Yep. So, which is a, a you know a brilliant philosophy on its own. Um, but it, they're, they're seamlessly they just similar, right? Like mm. the ideas are similar. Yeah, yeah. Again, like there's a perennial um, idea was underlying there all the time. I think. Yeah. And these scholars have just l revealed and um, verbalized it. I think. Yeah, yeah. That's all there is. And it's, for some reason, in all in all Eastern philosophical tradition they shared all this basic premises mm, yeah, i think yeah and that's it's so fascinating it is fascinating mm. it is really fascinating so the thing is that and like what we were talking about before is that the Tao, you know what twege was talking about and this like that uh empty nothingness but full of potential that we call Tao or whatever is beyond reason, right? We can only allude to it with uh, symbols and words, which is what you and I are doing now and what Lao Tzu was doing with the Tao Te Ching, right? You can only allude to it uh, with words, you know, which, which is precisely the point of this chapter, like what we're being direct directed towards, right? Mm -hmm. the, precisely the point of the Tao Te Ching mm -hmm. is that it can only be alluded to through with words and symbols. Yeah. But it, it's still beyond beyond reason. Yeah. So. It's, um, again, it's unfathomable. Mm. It's not something that we can understand intellectually. Mm. But we can only understand it and get our own version of conclusion from taking on board mm. and make it as your own self-knowledge mm. and practicing that knowledge. You can only kind of grasp a little like, kind of smell of it. Yeah, you get an idea of what it is. Mm. You can't have an idea of what it is without a little bit of... You know, we have an intelligence as a human, right? And we're supposed to enhance and cultivate that to a certain degree. So you need to have kind of an intellectual grasp of what you're talking about. Otherwise, you become a new age spiritual right. flaky person mm. that don't really understand anything mm. but think they do, but they're a bit dreamy. They're not grounded. Isn't it funny that when you think... So, okay, like in those new age spirituality movement, that... They uh, try to understand uh, this, um, their own version of spirituality. Yep. And they say, um, I don't know, channeling and yep. they see things. And, but that um, somewhat seemingly intuitive knowledge that they think they understand mm. is actually not understanding it not understanding, at all. Yeah, yeah. Ironically, from your having your Athara studying and research, mm. once you have that kind of a intellectual understanding of things, mm. that you can grasp yeah, of the course, idea. Yeah. Well, most of the great teachers throughout history were scholars. You know what I mean? The reason why they could verbalize and teach mm. and guide people properly was because they were scholars, like all swamis in in. Hinduism are all well-learned scholars, but they're, they're well-learned in the, the words and the symbols of the divine, yeah. you know, so they, they, are, they have a good map for everyone, you know, mm -hmm. but, we, but, but the understanding of spirituality is that the map is not the territory. We have a good map. Yeah. The Tao Te Ching is a perfect map, yeah. but it's not the Tao. Mm -hmm. And I get, this, I get this often a lot. Mm -hmm where people will say to me, and they're trying to kind of play spiritual one-upsmanship, where they say, if, if Lao Tzu said that you can't describe it with words and, and uh, this and that, then why did he write the 81 chapters of the Tao Te Ching? And you're just doing the drongs of face palm again. You know, you're like, oh, like 
get out of this anal- analytical game of spiritual one-upsmanship. Mm. That's new age, right? Like that's trying. To, you're trying to put yourself on a pedestal above Lao Tzu. Somewhat, that's a superimposed into intellectual th- way of thinking. Yeah, of course. Mm. But the reason why Lao Tzu left the Tao Te Ching behind because when he was asked to leave something behind, leave his wisdom behind, that's the wisdom of the Tao. It's not the Tao, but it's the wisdom of the Tao. Right. You know, it's a map. It's not the territory. Intelligent people understand that. That's the difference. And I have also had some of that too, right? Like a, the Art of Effortless Living, my film, where some people may comment and go, you've already failed because you're trying to explain the Tao. And it's like, oh, well, I mean, where do you start? You know, where do you start? Again, that's a new age comment. And it's best not to to respond to such trolley comments because it's only going to go south fast but we need for people who are on my channel and 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 watch our and listen to our podcast we're trying to take spirituality up to the real level Mm -hmm. right we're taking it up to the next level Mm -hmm. we're trying to get out of this new age bs that has unfortunately infiltrated eastern spirituality and we're trying to reclaim Taoism, buddhism and hinduism for what it is we're not we're not trying to make up our own people are so eager to make up their own ideas about spirituality and that's not my game i love studying the traditions and i love exploring the traditions you know and that's what i write about and that's what we you and i are always talking about privately and on here and that's the only way and the, the one way and only way to understand it thoroughly yeah of course yeah. not otherwise i don't think it can there's no alternative for this of course not of course not. You've got to take the traditional knowledge and that's it. Traditional yeah. knowledge as in its own fashion. In its own fashion, yeah. yeah. If you've got your own philosophy, just create your own philosophy. Exactly. But Don't mix with the Lao Tzu or, you know. You and I talking the other day, we saw a, a book. I don't want to mention the title of the book, but we saw the I Ching mixed with the tarot and all of that. And it's like, no, no. They're their own traditions. Don't mix them and don't... I mean, you can speak about them somewhat in relation to each other. Like comparative religion is, and comparative philosophy is a good thing because mm. you can learn what we're basically doing on here is com- in comparative. You know, in a lot of my books, I, I compare the traditions. But you don't want to mix them to make up their own system because that's not how it works. In, in, in the end of the day, the I Ching and Tarot are pretty... Even though there might maybe some similarities, they're still pretty far apart. So you don't want to you know, take liberty at trying to mould these traditions. And again, the the problem that I have with that sort of books is that um, they always like to connect these ancient knowledge through something like tarot so that to um, trigger people's mind with the materialism. Mm, Yeah, of course, yeah. Um, tarot, well, I'm, I'm not, I don't know much about it, but it will have its own, um, I mean, studies and philosophy fundamentals and mm. something like that. Mm-hmm. But yet, but again, mixing with that, with the I Ching, and in Chinese tradition, people have been using I Ching as in like a fortune telling mm. kind of thing but extracting only that kind of value and to benefit our desire in mm. materialistic way is very ino- inappropriate yeah. I Ching is purely based on movement of the energy of the universe mm-hmm. and that's been represented as in hexagram mm, of course and the movement of hexagram was to tell the possibilities and the potentialities of the of the world. Basically. Of the world, yeah, yeah. That's what the what it's based on. Mm. It's not just to uh, give us a, what's going to happen tomorrow. <laughs> it's make it's so silly in the end. Well, that's why Richard Wilhelm said we had to take we have to take the eating from a book of divination to a book of wisdom Mm. because it's really a book of wisdom because you know you can sure if you follow the hexagrams and you understand the stalks and all of these things you know properly there may be something that you can foretell you know forecast in the future but the I Ching itself is an instrument that's based more on our psychology 
So it's like a metaphysical psychological system mm. where you understand the patterns within your own mind and you know it's 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 a vast system that that takes a long long time to study and it, it's it, it it requires more than one read through you know what i mean like i subscribe to the wilhelm translation but i'm you know i'm going to explore a few other translations because i've been, read that translation for a long time but you know it requires more uh, it's not just a book of divination it's, it's it's a much vaster thing but that's a whole other topic but it's a good segue and to get into the other part of the Tao Te Ching that we haven't explored yet, because you're talking about materialism. What were you, what were you going to say? No, that's absolutely right. I'm mm. saying that, mm. that it, some people study I Ching in relation to Tao Te Ching and all that and for a lifetime. Mm. Yeah, for right? sure. And us being microcosm of mm. the universe, that looking within and find the pattern of our own psychological uh, behavior, mm -hmm. we will find a certain pattern based on the real tradition of eating. Yeah. Because you are a representation of the whole, you are that microcosm, the, the pattern that, is, that comes through you is on the psychological and spiritual level. And so it's not something that you explore out here to get a car or to get a house or deciding whether you should buy a car or a house. This is all secondary in nature, and that became sort of a popular trend due to commercialism and, and materialism. The real nature of it is understanding kind of your place in the universe, yeah. understanding how certain hexagrams relate to you and combinations of them relate to you and so forth and so on. But like I said, this is a good segue into the next part of the, 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 the chapter we haven't explored mm -hmm. because we're talking about materialism and, and our focus on that. Mm -hmm. When we get into so after like oh one fathom or source and ten thousand things so so Lao Tzu is basically saying that you know you know you just have to have reverence towards this right you can't understand it so then the next part of the chapter he goes on to say blunt the sharpness untangle the knot soften the glare merge with dust mm -hmm. and this is like a kind of a guide for those who have got their ears cleaned out mm -hmm. and their mind is attuned to uh, deeper spiritual topics. This is kind of a guide to how we have to behave mm. to align with the yeah. Tao, you know. Mm. So, first of all, blunt the sharpness. Yeah. What does that mean? It obviously means being sharp with your with your tongue, being, you know... Ex like, you, that, like that troll? Like that troll, yeah. YouTube, YouTube is a good example, right? If you quickly... And you're just... You're blurting out things and you're not sitting there calm and that's... You're too sharp. Mm. So blunt the sharpness. So Lao Tzu is saying blunt it. Like stop being intellectually like analyzing everything and cutting it up and you know, like uh, promoting your opinion on others and superimposing your beliefs on others. You've got to blunt all that crap. You know what I mean? And so blunt the sharpness is, is always uh, one of the the main actual spiritual practices in in, in in all the Eastern traditions, right? Yeah. Like, you can't go around being a troll on the internet and just because you disagree with a certain thing and then you you put your opinion, you're, you're already too sharp. Mm. You've got to blunt that stuff. And what people don't understand is when you start to blunt it, you start to become more humble and you start to feel mm. those fundamental forces within you. start to feel the Tao move through your life. You can't feel it when you're sitting around there condemning everyone and you're so opinionated and... For example, like our our, our um, just um, trait and our temperament being so pointy, mm. whether that's a rectangle or triangle or whatever, yeah. when it's pointy, <laughs> when it uh, needs to fit somewhere, it has to find the perfect spot to fit in, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you blunt those sharpness around the edges, mm. it becomes wiggly, mm. it becomes flexible, mm. it can fit anywhere it goes mm. and become much more e at ease mm. right mm. just like human human being yeah definitely mm. and the next part of that is untangle the knot which is a you know probably self-explanatory to most people but uh it's the knot we develop in our heart right mm. so we develop and that knot is due to desires beliefs our own personal agenda, 
it, it's related to blunting and sharpness too, right? Like yeah, it's just the conditioning and the habitual way of thinking, mm, I think. Mm. And the problem is the way we think uh, becomes habitual so that it um, becomes too concrete, isn't it? It's funny how we always talk about not in relation to that because we do... Even f- bodily, like yeah, physically. Yeah, physically, well. because we do feel it energetically, right? That not in our heart or in our mind or our heart mind you know we feel that not like but it's not like not like a knot in your shoulder but it's an mm. it's like a, a a sensation it's an energy and so like so when someone says something that you disagree with there's that you it's feel some, yeah, you yeah, feel yeah. the knot right a bit of a blockage there's there, a blockage right? and you got to start to untangle that right and so Lao Tzu is trying to describe methods to untangle that. So obviously blunting the sharpness. Blunting the sharpness in relation to untangling not means you're not acting out of your own desire, you're not acting out of your own opinions, your own agendas. You're just trying to become shanti, shanti, shanti. Like no, you're not trying to interfere with life. There's just too much of that already, you know. Everyone always says and everyone tries to shame each other for not having an opinion on this and that and that's already coming from the knot you got to start to untangle that crap and start to purge Mm. these desires and that that you have and i think that could also reflect on um, psychological history as well Mm. yeah like people who have gone through such traumatic experience in the past or um really really um bad experience that influenced you influence you to think in certain way and change your mind or something like that mm. becomes a burden in the end mm. so that prevents you to be a natural human being right yep so that blunt that sharpness mm. that like a strong opinion that was influenced by the past experience yep. and also entangled the note so that yes yeah, so release that um T- tension basically. tension yeah mm. tension that you stored deep inside you mm. it can be very long and arduous um, process but we have to do that in order to become a free human being yeah it's a blockage like what you said before it is a blockage it's a, it's a blockage and it's you know to, to to you know elaborate on what you were saying it's it's, it's related to the samskaras right mm. so for those who don't understand samskaras and sanskrit it's uh, samskaras are the mental impressions and uh, subconscious imprints we 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 all have within us like we've accumulated from birth and like what you said like you can have traumatic experiences when you're young or you could even be a hostage to good experiences from when you were at birth so when you want to repeat it yeah 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 Mm. see there's 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 you can look at it many ways Mm. and so we all are impeded by these samskaras Right, because they affect our vasanas, our habits, and our tendencies, which affects our karma, our actions in the world. And that's why, when we talk about samskaras, we kind of talk about karmic stock. These are your karmic stock, or they're in your karmic storehouse. So you think about the basement of a house, and you, we, you know, like when most people had in the, well, I don't know, garage or yeah, yeah, you just basement. keep all your crap there. Oh, where do we put this? And the mum and dad would just say, I just chuck it in the garage. And you look, I mean, you look at it and you're thinking, shouldn't we just be throwing this crap away? And this is kind of a metaphor for how we operate because we don't let stuff go. We're not letting things go because we're not observing what it is fully. We're not paying attention to our past samskaras and they are influencing our present life. And so, as we know, all of the spiritual paths of the East, especially Taoism, is about this sort of letting go, this purging process. You've got to let that crap go, man. I mean, I know you experienced trauma at a young age but eventually you have to let that go you know and that may be rich for other people to say to someone and and we can all sympathize with that individual but eventually for their own health and sanity they have to let that go that's right i mean you can totally understand why they dwell on that because uh that just was too painful and it just did the too much of a damage psychologically yeah. Yeah. so you can understand why it's so hard to let it go mm. and not that they are, they want to holding on to it. It's just there. Yeah. It's just there. But so that what you have to do is that to deal with it. Mm-hmm. You have to do something about it instead of sitting on it. You know. Yeah. And like you said, eventually 
it'll if you just sit on it, it'll just prevent for you to move on. Mm, yeah. You can't keep your health and sanity. You mm. can't grow out of it. Yeah. So that eventually you'll have to um, deal with it. Mm. And cure cure that damage and move on. Yeah. And only that way you can um, again be a natural human being and being a sane person. Yeah. Mm. It's all about awareness with those things. A lot of people think that it's like a computer game. You know, you got to go back to your past. You got to work it out. You got to unpack everything. It's not really about that. It's 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 about instead of avoiding what has happened. Just being aware of it and bringing your awareness back to it, and it's it's amazing that when you start to bring more awareness back to certain past traumas, that's when the letting go just be- mm-hmm. begins to happen because it's the awareness that lets it go. You're putting the light in the dark, so exactly. to speak, as a metaphor, and so that's how you can let that darkness is kind of like related, sort of negative, but you know that's how you can let that sort of darkness dissolve and uh, you have to bring it up instead of keeping it keeping it down dormant yeah. <laughs> and down you have to bring it up yeah. and uh, again you have to somewhat put a bit of effort hmm. you can't just hmm. uh, say even you were to go and see a psychiatrist or someone like that and to try to deal with it but at the end of the day if you don't practice it if you don't put good amount of effort to change it it's all useless. Useless, yeah. You have you yourself have to put a lot of effort to fix that problem, to move on, yeah. and you have to always bring it up, and you have to always inquire. I think always yeah. question it, like why did it happen, and how did I respond, so that that reaction that back then may be related to my reaction right now or something like that you have to i think constantly question it and contemplate on certain things and Mm. only that way i think you can move out of it grow out of it Mm. well that's why certain meditation practices like vipassana meditation is a technology to deal with that right so it gets down to the sensory level where we where we have these feelings that come up in the nervous system right and so you are placing your awareness on these uh, samskars that are coming through your, sen- your, your, your sensorium, mm-hmm. your nervous system, and you're trying to, in a sense, untangle those knots, mm-hmm. you know, which empties out the basement or the garage, and then you become a completely free person, like yeah, liberated person. It's, yeah. Enlightenment, as, as we've talked about before, can be related to weight, right? Like you're, when you're carrying a lot of those samskars, you're heavy. Mm-hmm. You feel heavy. You have baggage. Where enlightenment, light, is not light like the light that you and I got shining on us now. It's weight. Mm. So you feel like mm, your back gets, gets straight. You're, there's no <laughs> tension in your, in your prefrontal cortex. You know. Yeah, like when you keep your old uh, samskaras in your storage, life becomes so burdensome, mm-hmm. I think. Mm-hmm unconsciously because you're not trying to cleanse that storage you know but Mm. once you have dealt with it Mm. life is much more enjoyable and like you said it's light your Mm. your body is light your mind is light and you're happier i remember when my dad passed away and he was a hoarder mum was a hoarder too and then when (laughs) (laughs) and so when well, my two brothers and my sister went when we were kind of like cleaning out their bedroom and and everything, and there's just like things like way back in the you didn't cupboard. Even know they oh, were there for from the sixties, from the sixties, and you're just like, why? Why is he? Why does he have this? Yeah, why? Yeah. So you don't want to become a hoarder of your experiences, mm. both negative and positive. You have to have kind of a lucidity to it. You know what I mean? Like which. Uh, implies that we should always live more in the present but with a sense of uh, non, non-attachment to things and so hoarding and and accumulating sam, samskaras means we are still attached to it we haven't essentially worked it out or let it go and so which then moves on to the the next part so after untangle or not it says soften the glare yeah. 
soften the glare. Now, this is an interesting one, right? Like, because when you look in the eyes of an individual, even if we look at this from a, from a physical perspective, mm. right? When someone is too serious mm. or someone has too many opinions, mm. there's a certain look in the eye yeah. that you can sense, right? Almost somewhat like what? Aggressive? Aggressive. There's an aggression in the eye. I remember I had a friend once and he said, there's something funny, interesting. Now, this is no offense. I don't mean this as any offense to some Americans, but he said that, you know, sometimes some Americans, they have a certain look in the eye, like it's a very uh, defensive look, Mm. like they're protective of their sort of property and property here, meaning their beliefs, their agendas and, and, you know, America in some sense is a pretty fragmented society. Yeah. And so you sense this sort of this look. Like it's almost too serious and and too opinionated. Now I don't think that's that's obviously not isolated to America. It's everywhere. It's here in Australia. Yeah, it's, we it, see it everywhere. You see it everywhere. Mm-hmm. But there's a certain look, and that's when someone is wound up way too tight. They they've wound up. They're not as like like I don't know what it is. It's whole like body. whole body. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a knot on one of those big cruise ships. You know what I mean? So <laughs> so on those big ropes. So but you sense that look. And it's interesting when you go into monasteries and ashrams, there's a focus on softening the glare. It's actually a practice where you try not to look in the eyes of another person and you always, it, it's, a, it's a teaching of humility where you try not to look and you, you look, you, 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 your eyes are downcast. Mm. Your eyes are downcast. And it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a representation of mm. that you're, you're, not, mm. you're not trying to be above mm. this person it, it, but it's also not an act of saying that you're beneath this person. It just means that... Act of being humble. Humble, that's yes. That's what it is. That's what it is, yeah. You lower your opinion, lower mm. your identity. Mm. And again, that's why I think in certain Buddhist tradition they have that you don't uh, look at your masters into their eyes. No, no. It's, I think that's in all um, Fires and Asian... Maybe just Asian in general, mm-hmm. there has that sort of underlying um, thing, I think. Mm-hmm. I, th- I remember when I was a kid, like, uh, someone said, like, to a, a young person, how dare you look at me into my eyes? <laughs> Something like that. It's obviously the older person. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there is that underlying thing, which if you were to say to a Westerner, they would, why, why is that a problem? Yeah, yeah. Don't you look at people's eyes when you talk? Hmm. This will be the reaction. Hmm. But that's, uh, again, just being part of tradition, that not looking in the eyes to uh, hmm. your master or something mm-hmm. like that is just um, your, um, you are showing your respect to someone. You're just lowering yourself. I guess demanding it is a little strange though too, right? Like when, oh, yeah, when, an, old, uh, <laughs> when, yeah. a, when an older ordinary person yeah. demands that, he's like, come on, you're not a spiritual master or something like that. You're, nah, no, just an ordinary yeah. <laughs> older person. But the irony is, is that, and I've seen this personally, is that so you, when your eyes may be downcast with a master, someone comes in who are unfamiliar with like those sorts of uh, practices, and they will speak eye to eye with the master. But the master has no problem mm. because they don't have a sense of arrogance or, right. you know, they don't care. Mm-hmm. It Actually, you could speak eye to eye and it wouldn't matter. Mm. You know, it's just kind of a sign of respect too within the spiritual traditions. But the whole idea about it is to soften your glare, to get out of your mind. And mm. it's a practice of actually bringing you right back down to the ground, you know, right back down so that you're not opinionated and, mm. you know, We've all had experiences like that, right? I mentioned on the podcast that time before of an individual who came on a tour with us and snapped about Indian food and stuff like that. And, like, they have that they, oh, yeah, yeah, that yeah. look. Mm. And no matter what we experienced in India, that individual will require longer and longer and longer period of time um, in India mm. and working on themselves. Mm. Because eventually... That that hardened look, that glare that people have, mm. that that's not natural. That's just something that's happened where uh, that's a product of individualism, right? Yeah, it's yeah, a product yeah. of that you should have a belief in your nation, your religion, your own sense of self. So you have this uh, you have this um, layer in your brain, thick, in, in, thick eggshell on top of your head. Yeah, on top of your head, yeah. which affects 
your eyes because yeah. your eyes are the windows to the soul. Mm. And so... And I think uh, another beauty I, would, I want to say, they soften the glare, like you said, that you're not looking the eye, your master's eyes and things like that, is that the act of lowering yourself and the act of being humble, the humility. And the, what's beautiful about that is that in Eastern tradition, humility itself was valued. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So that softening the glare, lowering yourself is uh, was valued so that something that you should practice mm. in your spiritual journey. Yes. Whereas being humble nowadays, not even nowadays, like even let's say 50 years ago, I think it, that value is lost mm. already a long mm. time ago. But even being lost in the East, unfortunately. Oh, right? yeah. You know, yeah, so I'm talking about the, the whole globally. World. Yeah, whole world, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, again, I mentioned this once to my younger brother, mm. that how being humble is actually important, is that, and then he said, um, basically, oh, no, you're saying something very like, uh, what, old ancestors? <laughs> You sound like a bloody like great 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 father grandfather or something, because uh, yeah. nowadays nobody talks about that sort of stuff. Actually, I was a bit shocked because <coughs> at that point I've already moved on from Korean society a long time yeah. for a long time. Mm. So when I actually heard that and him saying that, it was like a very shocked and kind of very disappointed. Especially him being so young when he said it. I remember mm. when you know when that all happened. Mm. It's um. Yeah, it's pretty sad when someone that young doesn't understand the value of humility yeah. and how important it is and, like, how easy life is when you are humble too, right? That's that's something that people don't think about. Yeah. Well, that is why the Tao Te Ching is a book on humility, right? Essentially, like, it, of course it's about understanding or coming to uh, a comprehension of what the Tao is from the, our, our own limited intelligence <laughs> but it's also a book about humility and also like if you look at drunks the drunks is a book of humility but also on humor right the Dalai ching is quite not not so much a book on humor but more so a book on humility and also a critique of society particularly confucianism because it's from that time but uh that people are that well that s certain teachings like the Tao Te ching are sort of disappearing into the background not just the Tao Te Ching but most a lot of spiritual text unfortunately then it's no surprise there's humility and that starts to be devalued and this is why when people come across you and I they think that you and I from like and it must have came here from the 1700s or something like that with the way that we think but <laughs> we are really like that I mean again like you don't even know how to use a tablet no or the phone yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's too much. I can't. I just can't do it. It's. I mean, I'm too. I'm too busy doing other things. Like, I can't learn how to do all that. Yeah, I mean, you don't have to learn. You just, you just get to do it. But the thing is, you don't even make yourself to need to do that. No, of course, yeah. yeah well, but again, because there's nothing really in life that I. I when do I need to do, use that? You know what I mean? Like. I mean, it doesn't make sense. Like, I mean, I, I upload all of these YouTube videos and that yeah, through the, yeah. on the computer and stuff. So, mm. I mean, I don't know where a phone or, or a smartphone specifically where that fits in to the mm. whole narrative, yeah, you know. exactly. And again, like... Not it, important. And again, as you know, as you know me, being a writer and also creating content, having too many distractions is, is just detrimental. So, like... Actually, a lot of people who watch the content actually appreciate that I don't have a phone and stuff so i think nowadays again like uh, in just uh, let's say just any average people's life a uh, 80 percent is being distracted by these devices mm -hmm. i believe yeah, of course, yeah. uh, that's why they always feel lack of time of doing certain things mm. but just bloody get rid of those mm. distractions yeah of course, simple yeah, yeah. Mm. So, now the next line. So we got soften the glare. We got that one done, dusted, <laughs> <laughs> and now we have merged, merged with dust. So 
poetically dusted. Mm. Now, this obviously merge with dust is again coming on the back of those last three lines. So blunt the sharpness, untangle, not soften the glare. Merge with dust. So it's, it's it's a massive lesson on humility. Merge with dust. So it become as low as dirt. Yeah. So line by line, it taken as a like a level. Level. Yeah. Like, you're going down. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we're yeah. taking you off this pedestal and we're driving you straight back down. Yeah. Turn into dust. Turn into dust. So. It doesn't literally want you to turn it us. It's, it's, it's a metaphor for becoming so humble that you are you understand that a human life is no greater than an ant's life. Everything is equally uh, important. There is no there is no specialness. So the problem, uh, one of the problems with especially New Age spirituality, is they made it into a certain form of specialness where humans are so special, and you know uh, the rest of the world is you know just just there for humans it's a human playground that's why they always constantly play this game of one-upmanship yeah, yeah. They, they love that game they love that game mm. yeah. yeah i remember a satsang in tiru probably 2010 and with muji and a, and a lady came up maybe maybe she was in her 50s and she said how do all of us enlightened beings here in this room change the world and you could see Muji kind of <laughs> you know like cringe in the back of his seat like like I didn't really understand oh, I forget what he said but it, but he kind of went in a different direction mm. and you know skillfully went in another direction but that's again that's what new age spirituality has become it's a, it's not about being humble it's about being special it's about being at the top it's about being sounding more profound than the next person there that's why when I get new age comments on on YouTube, I kind of just I avoid them because I know people are just trying to play a game with me to to feel as though they're better than me. And okay, you can be better than me. That's okay. You can win. I don't need to play. I don't want to be part of that. So here we ought to merge with dust, right? So like we have to bring our mind back to the ground, and and I think it's a. It's not. Um, it is a metaphorical uh, line, but it is also literally as well. Mm, mm. We all become dust. Well, we become dust, yeah. Physically, <laughs> physically, we all <laughs> going to die, yeah, yeah. and we all going to whether become cremated or buried, mm, mm. become um, in animals, become ashes, or become animals' food and um, food for worms. Food for worms, and um, you literally becoming mm. dust. And whether it's a choice, whether you want to acknowledge it consciously while you're alive, mm. or you want to ignore it. Mm -hmm. But truth uh, is the truth. Mm. It's there. It, it, no matter if you want to deny it or not, mm. that's how you're gonna turn out. So know it, or you don't want to know it. Mm. It's up to you. And you will live on your life according to your um, uh, your understanding, mm. your choice, based yeah. on your choice. Mm. Well, yeah, it's a, it's a contemplation on your own mortality, right? Like mm. a lot of the time we, well, I would say on average, most people fear death. And because they fear the unknown, they fear uncertainty and so forth and so on. And so the Tao Te Ching is saying, no, no, lean into that. Go into that. You're going to die. But in understanding you're going to die, it also makes you humble as well. It brings you back down to ground. And it also makes you uh, value your life a bit more. So where you can use your life well, so to speak, instead of just being vacant in life and be like what you were saying with distractions before and, you know, going through life, you know, vacant, basically, like with nothing really. There's no uh, vibrancy in your your life you know you don't live a full-fledged life yeah Tzu is kind of saying that you know once you be empty you start to live a full-fledged life and the Tao can make use of you and That's but you can only come to that uh, that state when you begin to merge with dust so That's fine. but merging with dust here meaning that bringing you right back down to the ground mm -hmm. and bringing making you so humble it's like it's like uh, they use water as an analogy in, in Taoism right where water Always seeks the lowest places, but paradoxically, it's the most powerful force in nature. So, if you've seen a tsunami, you understand that. And as the sea level rises, 
yeah, big you, trouble. Big trouble, yeah. Mm. So water nourishes all. Doesn't it? Doesn't have prejudice. It seeks the lowest places, but paradoxically, is the most powerful force in nature. And because it can put out fire, fire can't win against water. That's right. And so that's got to be our state of consciousness, right? We, we, we seek the low places, and that's what merging with dust is. You're seeking the low places. And paradoxically, like what we were talking about with nothingness and emptiness, when you begin to seek those low places, that's where the the duh and the virtue begins to come from, the power. Mm-hmm. The, you know, Tao Te Ching means the book of the way and its virtue, right? If you translate in English. Yeah. It's the book of the way and its virtue. People think it's the book of the way. And it's like, no, no. It's the book of the way and its virtue. Dao, the, yeah. Dao, yeah. Dao being the way and yeah. De being the virtue. Exactly. And Qing is the book. It's book, yeah, yeah. exactly. So, and you're trying to come into harmony with that process, the Dao De, the Dao De right? Yeah. So, and that's what it's about. It's about emptying, coming back down to the low place, seeking the low places or the low road as Lao Tzu says and then then the universe can make use of you so and that's what merge with dust is and so getting into the last few lines we kind of explained a little bit of those already earlier but oh hidden deep but ever present so again it's it's at the depth of our core right yeah. But it's always there. Mm. And we, we sort of alluded to that before. Like It's inconceivable. You can't see it. You can't touch it. But it's always there. Mm. You can access it through your own inner being. Mm. That's what it is. Yeah. Mm. And it's ever present. Yeah. It doesn't ever leave you. Because mm. it, it doesn't judge you as good or bad. Mm. These are human and social concepts judgments where you are only in in reality a manifestation of the Tao, of the manifestation of the ten of the ten thousand things and the ten thousand things being, being a manifestation of the Tao. and so that's all you are but we made up these what warps our nature is we made up human society and rules based on good and bad based on other people's opinions of what good and bad is and and countries and religions and you know, I get a few comments and emails about uh, <clears throat> sin in relation, especially to Taoism and this and that. And it's like, no, 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 it doesn't, doesn't. There's no such there's concept. There's no, no such concept. Mm-hmm. That's, a, again, a Christian idea. And if you're walking around with Christian ideas and you're a Westerner, then you're still influenced. But And you say you're not Christian, you're still influenced by Christianity. Mm. Where Eastern spirituality don't have a, a, such a stringent idea on sin. Mm. Especially when I talk about Taoism, there's no such thing. There's just nature. What you would call, or anything that would be even close to sin, would be some. Would you'd just be saying that you warped your nature. Your nature is warped. Mm. And 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 Zhuangzi, as he says with Qing, the species-specific essence, you're just dissecting between this and that, and you're creating an illusion of good and bad, which creates Maya, the illusion in your mind, this framework of a reality that's all compartmentalized and. And live in, in a dualistic world. Yeah. When the Tao is non-dual, mm. and you understand that when you begin to get out of that Maya state of consciousness and the Qing of mm. partiality, right? Mm. So in the Zhuangzi, there's this constant emphasis on impartiality. Mm. Stop dissecting things into this and that. It doesn't mean you don't say that that's a chicken and that's a cow. Of course you know that. But the the, the heightened sense of that, right, yeah. where you... I have these beliefs and I'm going to start promoting them. I'm going to be in the street giving out the Bible or the Bhagavad Gita or something like this. Mm. You're already fooled <laughs> and into this idea that you have the answers and the world doesn't. Mm. And that's a really uh, arrogant way to think. Mm. And that's Lao Tzu's point. Mm. And, and especially being a critique of Confucianism because mm. he's looking at Confucius in that time going, have you seen that guy? Like he's out, he's traveling all the way around China, trying to influence the leaders of all of the states, trying to sell his ideas, sell his basically. ideas, mm. and he did. Yeah, he sold people on it, and it. Be- and these are kings and rulers bought into it, and he bought into it. Yeah, they- and Lao Tzu's just in the background every night, going, "Ah, oh, did you see him today, Jesus?" <laughs> like he's in the street handing out his little pamphlets, and <laughs> 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 yeah, uh, the thing is, like society. It was created for 
um, collective good mm. is a, um, since the human dawn of human civilization that, uh, that we the population been ever growing right mm. so that to make it uh, life more comfortable for everyone was to have a, a collective society big community mm. right yeah, of course. so that whatever rules and regulations come to place is to benefit collective world, the collective mm. group of people. It's mm. not about to nourish individual and human nature. Mm. That became secondary. secondary. Why? Because the world became too big and too populated. And so many people... Complex, yeah. Complex, yes. Mm. More individuals come to existence and things become more complicated yeah, and complex. Sure. But again, mm. the Qing and Lao Tzu was to move back to the human nature, mm. to bring that light back to human nature, mm. what our nature is. And uh, in relation to socialization, what that socialization did to us, mm. and looking within, looking back as a human species, back to humanity, mm. so to understand the origin of species, basically. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Exactly. Yeah. Again, it's a it's a round of, it's a diametrically opposed philosophy compared to philosophies that are promoting rules and regulations. Where Lao Tzu's kind of <clears throat> anarchy is always a bad word to use, but it's only the only thing that you can really, in some sense, explain it is that you're going sort of <clears throat> he's running against the self cultivation and socialization model. So yeah, because he understands that all sorts of self cultivation and socialization and becoming cultured actually warps a person's intrinsic nature. And that is true. It doesn't matter what tradition you come from, that is true, right? So, because some cultures and some traditions adapt to certain individuals mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. but not all. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just the way it is because mm -hmm. you're in nature. It's like it's mm -hmm. not, you know, in nature things don't operate like that. The problem is uh, humanity tend to... Uh, puts much more emphasis on what's good for collective. Mm. That's the problem. Mm. So that we kind of ignore what is good for each individual, mm. freedom and their nature and yep. things like that. Yeah. So that it and now again, like the society being too large and too complex, mm. the almost uh, um, emphasis on human nature is kind of. Not, not common knowledge anymore. It's not even a thing, like because there is not uh, an understanding that there is human nature. Right. Pe people confuse human nature with human behavior, but human behavior right. is, is influenced by socialization. Yeah. You see? Mm. And that's Lao Tzu's point. And, and again, you can point this out numerous times, but people always make excuses for human behavior. They will say, oh, they were a bad seed from birth and blah, blah, blah. And it's yeah, like... That's where, where we are and yeah, 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 justification. Yeah. They're all justifications. Yeah. It's not the way it is. As Lao Tzu says, and as uh, Mencius says also, that we are fundamentally good from birth. And we all know that, right? But socialization and culture and that mold individuals. And because of our DNA, our certain psychological capacities and so forth and so on, <clears throat> which are all different, we all deal with the deck of cards we've been given differently. Mm. Some don't deal with it well at all. Mm. Others can can absorb a lot of stress and, and tension and they can just blast through life and be successful and so forth and so on. So this is so fundamental to understand, but people just don't think about it, right? Yeah. They don't think about it. And for you and I, it's, I mean, it's so easy. And for like people who are interested in Taoism, it's so easy to understand as well. Or if you're, even if you're a Shaiva, Shaivas understand it. That's why Shiva is an undomesticated god mm. you know shiva is not domesticated mm. because shiva is that which is not that which is wild that which is natural mm. not that which is social and cultural mm. not like a god as what you would envision right no like, no yeah. so shiva being a representation of brahman brahman is not something that's like molded in a society you know you don't get it that way no. it's something that is comes through you when you have let go of all of these social constraints yes. and restrictions. Mm. And 
that's the point see and that's what Lao Tzu is always alluding to is like you got to start to let go of the socialization and as uh, uh, no matter how uncomfortable it may feel mm. you've got to start letting that go because otherwise you'll never know the higher the higher realms of existence you'll, you'll never know the nature of consciousness you'll know the nature of what it is to be guy young as a social person who can do certain things in society but how far can that go mm. that can only go to the length of your lifetime and then when you start to get on death's door then you start to contemplate like god damn what was it all about yeah exactly what was it all about yeah, it's too late it's too late yeah i was playing guy young well all my life but that movie is coming to a close. Like, yeah, who, who am I really? Who was the director of this film? Right. You know, you should be looking at always who the director of this film is. Yeah, who is behind this? Yeah, film? yeah, yeah. Mm. And is the story and the play itself, the environment, the situations I, I were in, were they even really who I am? You know, like the way they were influencing me and this and mm. that, you know. Mm. So. Mm. And you're getting into it, so yeah, we kind of, we went all there and everywhere there. We kind of explained the last two, but we'll, we'll quickly go over them. I do not know from whence it comes, it is the forefather of the ancestors or of the gods. So I do not know from whence it comes. So it's it's unexplainable, right? Yes. You, it's, it doesn't come from, well, actually it doesn't come from anywhere. It's it's ever present, <laughs> as it says in the line before. Yeah, and also like uh, how Vedanta explains the Brahman, how Brahman doesn't have birth or death. No. Ever infinite. Infinite, yeah. Mm. Eternal. Yes. Eternal. And that's hard for a, a finite mind to comprehend, right? Yeah, th- yeah it is. It mm. is. Because when you ask people to contemplate the infinite, even when you close your eyes and you think about it, it's like, it's, it's incomprehensible because it's just because we have a finite mind. Finite mind means we think in logic, we think in reason, which are all limited linear linear and limited right limited and then linear like what you said they're not non-linear like mm-hmm. eternity is non-linear right like nature is non-linear it's hard to break the the riddle, riddle of thoughts that linear fashion out of that mind out, out of your mind isn't it like yeah. because mm. we always think we are going forward and mm. time is going forward mm. but what if not? What if not, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, uh, yeah that's completely um, out of our comprehension. So mm, it's, mm. Uh, it is hard to, hard to take on. You know? Well, that's why certain time systems like the Yugas and that were created, right? Because there was the thought of this cyclical nature. Yeah. What if it's like a fractal? Mm. You're just going through patterns and patterns. Your life is essentially a smaller pattern of a larger pattern. You're living maybe your same life over and over again. Who knows? We don't really know the nature of the game. But that's what it's about. We don't know from whence it comes. It's that vast. It's that incomprehensible. It's a mystery. It's a mystery. And that's what makes it wonderful. Yeah. That's what makes it uh, beneficial for us to contemplate on every day yeah. and, and, and explore. Yeah, I think it's, that makes life so much more fun. Of to course. Be yeah, 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 yeah. Like there's something to... Uh, try to discover and reveal and understand instead of you just a full stop have an answer mm. it's going to be pretty boring right well see one of the things and i've mentioned this in a podcast before one of the characteristics between uh religious say spiritual people and atheists where atheists lost the, a sense of war uh, awe and wonder mm. they had they lost a sense of awe, awe and wonder because from an intellectual perspective, you've worked out the game. Mm. And so the game is based on science and you can work everything out with scientific inquiry and you can come to logical conclusions. Where in religion or spiritual traditions like Taoism, you're left with a sense of awe and wonder, which keeps your mind curious. You keep a seeker's mind, which is very healthy. And you haven't worked the game out. You know the game, you can't work it out. (laughs) (laughs) You can't work it out. But... You're curious because the wonder and the awe of it and the majesty of it is just, it's intriguing. And I feel that's much more suitable to our nature as well. Yes, yeah. Because we are, uh, we, uh, we are a species which 
uh, able to think. Yeah. We have this faculty of intellectualizing and contemplating. We have also intuitive mind, and we have all these tools in our mm. mind. So they might as well just keep using it, of right? Of course. So that keep inquiring things, keep being, uh, keep being curious about things. They have this wonder, infinite mm. wonder about things. Uh, it's much more healthy and natural to our species, I think. Yeah. Mm. And if we look at it from a, from a cognitive level, from the brain's level, th- the scientific model and the model of, uh, that you can intellectually understand everything is only from this part of, this part of the brain. Yeah. It's not from here. Mm. So what does all of this have to do? It has to do with intuition. It has to do with a sense of wonder and awe. It has a sense to do with mystery because this unconscious regions of the brain is where, is where all of the fun begins. You know, here we can, all, we can all learn things. We can all dissect between this and that and we can analyze things. But once you come into harmony with this, there's, there's a natural aspect of that, which is why Robert Macaulay wrote that book, right? Uh, religion is natural and science. Why, why religion is natural and science is not. So he's talking about, from a cognitive perspective, it's, it's so natural for us to have an intuitive sense of Tao or Brahman. And science is actually almost, in some sense, from his perspective, it's unnatural because you're just operating from one part of the brain without considering this larger aspect. Uh, larger region of the brain. Yeah, you don't, you don't get to reach the potential of your brain, basically. No, you already have. No, but you just want to and make an end conclusion just like that, and oh, that's that, and that's it. And that's not, that's not fun. No. Well, they say that. How do we? use 100% of our brain, but people say that from a perspective of an, from an intellectual, intellectual, intellectual and logical perspective, but it's used, only using this part of your brain. Yeah. And this is why when they've tested monks and that who meditate and, and mm-hmm. who are long-term meditators, they have such a, they use such a huge part of their brain, you know, because they're accessing other part of their brain that's not accessed through intellectual inquiry and reasoning and, and so forth and so on. Mm. So the last line, which we've already kind of went over, but we'll just finish with this, mm. is it, it is the forefather of the ancestors or of the gods. So other translations say the gods. And, and the idea here, what Lao is getting at, is that this, this idea we have of Tao is before any concept of a a god before all of your ancestors before the birth of the universe it's before all of that it like the beginning of the beginning the beginning of the beginning and not even a beginning it's yeah. just ever present it's always there it's eternal it's the 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 it's the it of everything else i don't want to say father or mother because it doesn't it's, it's not a gender it's just there uh, and it's and it's what g- gave birth to everything else, and so the idea here, especially like if you look in Chinese, if they, they, there are some ideas of a god. Like if you look at Tian and stuff like that, and Lao Tzu saying before that, before that too, that's that's still a ruler god, you know, uh, that you pray to to get blessings and mm-hmm. you know to yeah, have fortune. Mm-hmm. That's like amateur spirituality. Before that, way before that, you know, it's it's as old as as old it's the ancient of the ancient yeah forefather of the ancestors yeah yeah so <laughs> and that's what uh the Tao is right so and yeah and um um trying to understand it and trying to know it and practice it will um give it give ourselves opportunity to become a like um somewhat a complete natural human being yeah mm. that's it that's it yeah so chapter four is about becoming that natural human being right it's about just like Tao. just like Tao. Mm. being empty being humble yeah this chapter explains what the Tao is very mysterious sense mm. 
And also it gives you how to do it as well. Yeah, it's a how-to, how-to, how-to manual. <laughs> it's really not long at all, no. but it shows the mysterious um, quality of what the Tao is mm-hmm. and also how you can practice it as well. Blunt the sharpness, entangle the knot, soften the glare, merge with dust. Yeah. It's just an attitude, isn't it? It's a, it's just a, a reorientation of, and a, and a sort of a moving away from what socialization expects from you. You don't have to meditate for this. You don't have to practice Tai Chi Chuan. It's just, it's all about uh, coming back to the low place, coming back to emptying your mind and not sticking to your beliefs and or what the world's telling you. Don't even listen to what the world's telling you. Often, what the world's telling you, they're trying to. They're like a bad salesman, you know. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you're like, here, yeah, you, you got to believe in this, and you're just like, bro, no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't wake up yesterday. I wasn't born <laughs> yesterday. I'm not. I'm not buying any of that nonsense you're trying to sell me. So, yeah, I watched something uh, last night. Uh, it's a short clip, um, just uh, like a conversation with these uh, great minds. Um, someone was saying, like, about the the beginning or starting point. Like, all the answers to our questions are in the the very beginning point. Mm. And mm. I think this chapter is a little bit like that yeah, too. Yeah. To understand the mysterious quality of the Tao is to mm, get an answer of who we really are, Yeah, I think. Yeah. You're contemplating the source, right? Like you said, they, they're talking about the beginning. Mm. You're contemplating the source of all existence. Mm. What could be more important? Yes. You know, your very being is a result of that. Yeah, again, that's why I love um, reading these classics. Because yeah. these classics that's been written, who knows when, Tao Te Ching, like thousands of years, uh, it... Uh, the the study of it, study of it, always the, pointing at the, the the source of all things, mm-hmm. source of the ten thousand things, and in any classics, yeah, yeah. definitely, definitely. Yeah. That's how. That's why it's so important. I think. Mm. Mm. That's why it's one of my favorite chapters, chapter four. Mm. It's so good. Mm. And so, so guys, I hope you enjoyed today. Uh, make sure if you haven't watched the first three episodes, go back and check those out where Goyang and I, we dissect those as well. And uh, if you enjoy the content, make sure you head on over to, if you want to support the channel, head on over to my Patreon page or, or my PayPal page. If you think what we're doing here is value, what we're creating here together, if you think it has value. So, and we hope you're doing well in the new year and we'll see you guys next week.